Located 120 miles west of Costa Rica, Isla Nublar is the home of a rather unusual theme park. In an incredible display of mankind's contempt for the natural order of things, the documentary series Jurassic Park showcases the work of Dr. John Hammond, who brought dinosaurs back from extinction. Amazing! It's an endeavor in which he claimed to spend no expense, despite not paying a computer programmer enough to not do industrial espionage. It's, uh, it's not a plot hole, don't worry about it. It's a chilling tale of man playing God, and today we're going to be looking at the frightening reality that Dr. Hammond has created in his efforts to line his pockets. That greedy bastard, in the name of science. Look, obviously, <laughs> that was a lie. Jurassic Park's not real. I fooled you. Probably not. Island Nibula isn't even a real place, and none of the people, events, or dinosaurs featured in the movie ever actually existed, which is honestly just a bit disappointing, isn't it? So, look, if we can't take an investigative look at the existence of Jurassic Park instead, why not let's examine the process of de extinction and see whether it could ever be actually done to dinosaurs using their preserved DNA? Why not? I'd, I'd ride a dinosaur. It'll be all right. <laughs> Half-Life 3 confirmed. We're not going to bury the lead here. The unfortunate truth is that it's just not possible to use preserved dinosaur DNA to clone dinosaurs and bring them back to the modern era. All right, thanks everybody for watching. I'll see you in that. Just kidding. Just kidding. Got to bulk this out. If I get this video over eight minutes, I get to put in mid-rolls, which means more money for me. Yay! So look, there's a couple of major reasons why we just can't, you know, get that sweet dinosaur DNA, pull it out of a mosquito and make a brand new dinosaur and maybe something to do with frog DNA. <laughs> Did I fall asleep during Jurassic Park? The first problem is that DNA just doesn't last forever. Like all other organic matter, it breaks down over time. This phenomenon even takes place when a sample is extremely well preserved inside amber. So look, you're probably familiar with the idea of radiocarbon dating. This is the process by which the amount of carbon-14 in the specimen is measured, and that's used to approximate the time period from which this material came into being. Carbon-14 has a half-life of 5,730 years, meaning that half of the molecules will have decayed over that period of time. Using this information, we can accurately estimate the age of an archaeological discovery with a pretty good degree of accuracy, at least until it reaches about 50,000 years old, which is fine, because as we all know, the Earth is only 6,000 years old, so we're good! Not really. DNA also has a half-life, and a much shorter one at that. The half-life of DNA is only 521 years, so after 1,000 years, 75% of the genetic information is lost. After 6.8 million years, every single base pair of DNA will have disintegrated, though naturally the samples would have become useless long before that, even if preserved in the miracle that is amber. Maybe on top of a kick-ass cane. Even if Dr. Hammonds were somehow able to fill in the gaps in the genome with frog DNA, the bit I fell asleep in, a 1,000-year-old dinosaur fossil would already be more frog than beast. Given the dinosaurs went extinct, wait for it, 65 million years ago, it's safe to say that none of the potential samples of dinosaur DNA, not even those encased in amber, would have any value for bringing dinosaurs back to life. Hammond would go into his lab, he'd put in that frog DNA, and he'd be like, oh no, we just got more frogs. Lots and lots of identical frogs that are all women. Females? Yeah, females. You may be immediately questioning this supposed information. Perhaps as a child or teenager, you remember seeing Jurassic Park in theaters only to discover that the previous year, in 1992, researchers out of the University of California had announced they had extracted gene fragments from a 40 million year old bee and were convinced it was only a matter of time before they found some parasitic insect that had filled its gullet with dinosaur blood. And no. That was not just an urban legend, it really did happen. However, upon the all-important peer review of that research, other researchers downgraded these claims from an incredible breakthrough and opportunity to, well, <coughs> utter bullshit. What had actually happened was that the samples were contaminated with newer DNA that resulted in a false positive. whoops a doodle <laughs> someone's career is ruined. With more sophisticated techniques developed that avoid these issues, it has been determined that even a sample that was only 10,000 years old would not contain any viable DNA. So, this leaves essentially no hope for samples that are, again, 65 million years old. Not the mammoth. For the sake of argument, let's just assume that somewhere, somehow, a viable sample of dinosaur DNA was discovered and we're prepared to clone it. Where exactly do you think you're gonna grow that baby dinosaur? Cloning does not work in the way that pop culture has taught most people to believe that it does. We couldn't simply build a 20-foot-tall test tube in which to grow a Tyrannosaurus. To 
produce a clone, the nucleus of an egg cell is removed and the hollowed out egg is fused with either the nucleus or whole cell of the creature being cloned. It's pretty incredible, but just not as incredible as in the movies. This egg then has to be implanted into the uterus of a host where it can grow. It's basically just in vitro fertilization with some extra steps. It should be clear, but the obvious problem with this is that we don't have any female dinosaurs wandering around to implant with this cloned embryo, and you just can't put the embryo in, you know, any old thing. The host and the clone need to be genetically similar enough that the host body will not reject the egg and will even be able to carry it to term. Even if we use the most genetically similar animal currently in existence, which are not similar enough at all, by the way, and even if they were somehow able to create a viable pregnancy, which they wouldn't be able to do, they would still be too small to host your favorite dino babies and well, that's it's just not going to be a good ending. However, while the issue of DNA degrading over time is seemingly an immutable law of nature, this second hurdle could potentially be overcome if we hadn't completely fallen down at the first hurdle. So our current cloning technology necessitates a living host rather than being fully grown in a lab. But there's no reason to believe that that will always be the case. Science is pretty fucking cool, and so we will undoubtedly find a way to bring an embryo to term in a laboratory setting. Of course, every extra minute that takes to develop is just more time for the dinosaur DNA to degrade, or at least it would be if it still existed. Once again, 68 million years ago. It's all gone. Stop dreaming. Terrible thunder pigeons. When dinosaur fossils were first discovered by ancient peoples, they thought them to be the remains of giant humanoids, the titans from mythology, because of course they did. As more fossils were discovered and they were better understood, people came to the conclusion that these were the remains of fire-breathing dragons. Unrealistic, but very cool, right? With nothing to go on bones, this wasn't really a terrible guess. It's possible that this original idea of dragons may have influenced the depiction of dinosaurs, but it is hard to say for sure. The term dinosaur didn't even exist until 1842 when it was coined by paleontologist Richard Owen. It comes from the Greek words for terrible and lizards, and it was chosen because they look like terrible lizards. <laughs> They're not dissimilar, are they? Lizards, dinosaurs, meh, you squint a little bit, same thing. Even if the idea came from these similarities, it's certainly possible that the many myths and depictions of dragons influence the depiction of their more aggressive and terrified traits. However, more recent research has taught us that the traditional view of dinosaurs is just, uh, it's just completely way off. So, let's throw away all the science and all the reason, and pretend for a moment that somehow, by some miracle, we were able to clone dinosaurs and bring them back to life. Yes! What would they actually look like? So this has been broadcast far and wide, so it might come as no surprise, but dinosaurs would look much more like birds than reptiles. Probably. We think. Still not sure. Dinosaurs are still classified as reptiles, but they're also widely varied, with roughly 50 new species of dinosaurs being catalogued every single year. That's cool. While the closest genetic relatives are birds, it's just not so cut and dry. They also consumed large amounts of food, and recent research indicates that they were warm-blooded, which would indicate similarities with mammals. However, because most of their traits can be found in later reptile species, all dinosaurs are still categorized as reptiles. Extremely detailed examination of dinosaur bones has allowed scientists to better determine what dinosaurs would look like. Of the ones we can identify, most look like colorful birds covered in feathers, though there are exceptions that are more in line with the traditional depictions of dinosaurs. However, this does bring up an interesting point. While we know that the closest living relatives of extinct dinosaurs are birds, and that many dinosaurs in fact look like birds, we can only make guesses about the fossils that have been found. Fossilization requires really specific circumstances to take place, and it's honestly a bit of a miracle that so many fossils have been found. That said, jungles and rainforests are absolutely terrible places for the formation of fossils, and fossil records in those areas are just virtually non-existent. This is a problem because much of the Earth was covered in jungle at the time of the dinosaurs, and there's even evidence that Antarctica at that time was actually a dense rainforest, which is cool. Simply put, this means that we will never have an an accurate picture of what all dinosaur life looked like, as most of it thrived in locations where fossilization just wasn't gonna happen. 
We have identified roughly 700 distinct species of dinosaurs thus far, but for all the species that will never be found, we have no way to know what they looked like. Evidence would suggest that the majority of these would be actually brightly colored with feathers. But we can't know for sure, not exactly the depiction of dinosaurs in those children's books, is it? Once more with feeling. So, if dinosaurs aren't able to be brought into the modern day, can animals that went extinct more recently? Well, scientists are hopeful that the answer is actually yes. But to date, there has only been a single de extinction. Sort of. It didn't really go that well, but it is still considered to be the first de extinction. The animal in question is the Pyrenean ibex. Now, if you've never heard of an ibex, it's basically a. It's, it's just a goat. It's just a fancy goat. The Pyrenean ibex was one of four subspecies of the Iberian ibex, also known as the Spanish ibex, and it was the second one to go extinct. While they used to be abundant, surprise, surprise, humans came along and we we hunted the shit out of them. Apparently, they tasted amazing. By 1999, there was only one of them left. One lonely little Ibex goat. <laughs> Scientists captured it and ate it. Not really. They took a tissue sample and then ate it. Not really. They released it back into the wild because they're scientists, not gastronomists. <laughs> Unfortunately, that Ibex then fell off a tree and died. Of course it did. <laughs> With these ibex now extinct, scientists set to work trying to clone her to bring the subspecies back to life. In 2003, their efforts began by transferring nuclei from her cells into domestic goat eggs and impregnating female goats. The species were similar enough that it was believed that this would work. When the pregnancy failed to come to term, they tried again and again. In total, they tried 208 times with 208 different female goats. In 2013, finally one and only one was able to bring an Ibex to term. That baby Ibex had a lung defect that made it impossible to breathe and it suffocated to death seven minutes later. It's not working out very well, is it, this cloning thing? <laughs> We're so far away. We're never getting dinosaurs back. I'm sort of disappointed. And so is the triumph of mankind's first ever de-extinction. Even if it works, there would still be a problem. Every Pyrenean Ibex we could clone would be female, so there would be no way for them to breed. The best case would be to breed them with some closely related southeastern Spanish Ibex and, through selective breeding, create a hybrid that was much closer to the Pyrenean variety than the southeastern, but it's still not a perfect solution. Once again, reality seems to be taking out all of the fun of playing God and all of the fun from science fiction. While the Ibex has been the only attempt at de-extinction through cloning, there are other species that went extinct far more recently than dinosaurs that are also prime candidates for some de-extincting due to having closely related species that could potentially bring them close to term. There are many possible future candidates, but the current candidates are a quagga, a subspecies of plain zebra, a thylacine, which was a carnivorous marsupial from Australia, despite sounding like an active ingredient in sleep medication, the carrier pigeon's lazy cousin, the passenger pigeon, McClear's rat, also known as the Christmas Island rat. It's so like, what should we bring back? Let's bring back a rat. Who doesn't love rats? And of course, the woolly mammoth. The woolly mammoth would be the species we could revive that has been extinct the longest, having gone extinct roughly 4,000 years ago. Unfortunately, freezing, which is how mammoths are generally preserved, is not the most ideal form of preservation as the crystallization of water molecules throughout the soft tissue causes cellular damage. While the soft tissue from frozen mammoths did not have enough usable DNA to create a clone, there was another alternative. Nuts, or more specifically, the preserved sperm cells that could be used for the artificial insemination of an elephant egg. Once again, this would result in a hybrid, so it's not a perfect solution. Fortunately, Russian scientists claimed in 2014 to have recovered well-preserved blood from a frozen mammoth carcass found in 2013, so actual cloning may be back on the table. It's not quite a dinosaur. But bringing back a woolly mammoth would still kind of be pretty cool. Wrap up. Sadly, we almost certainly will never be able to create real dinosaurs. Not only dinosaurs, but even species where we have the DNA, it's going to be really hard. Look, they tried to make that special goat, and it didn't even work very well even then. And they had a sample from a live one. Dinosaurs may have gone extinct millions of years ago, but with the exception of the woolly mammoth, all of the species currently trying to be revived became extinct at the hands of man through a combination of overhauling and destruction of habitat. Our failure to successfully clone an ibex that could survive outside the womb may just be nature's way of reminding us that our actions have consequences, and there are some things that simply can't be undone. On the other hand, it's just another species of goat, so who gives a f just joking, I love goats. Subscribe. Like this video. Thanks for watching.